Easter is the foundation stone of Christianity. It's the without which nothing. It's the hinge of the door that opens into this new life in Christ. And in the church at Corinth, there was a problem. And Paul writes to address the problem of how they understood Easter, how they understood the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And some were saying it didn't happen. Some were saying it's already happened and it doesn't affect us. So there are many consequences of misunderstanding the resurrection or of denying the resurrection. And Paul goes into great depth and trouble in chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, to, to answer those queries and to come to it. And in the process of looking at some of that chapter, we begin to understand how foundational this doctrine is for us. So, Lord, we pray as we look at your word that you will speak loud and clear, that we will hear it and respond in the way that we live. Amen. We are an Easter people and hallelujah is our name, <laughs> as someone said. Here it is, the seven ifs that Paul says. He says, if Christ is not risen, then this. First one in verse 12, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, then how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? So the first consequence is there's a confused witness. Some say one thing, some say another. And, and if they're saying that Christ has risen from the dead, how, how come some of you are saying that there isn't? Do you see what happens to Jesus isn't necessarily what's happening to us? Do you remember many of the uh, early Christians were Jews, of course, and one of the backgrounds in in contemporary Judaism was the Sadducee belief that there was no such thing as a resurrection. So you could argue, you could extrapolate from that and saying, well, well, Jesus is a one-off. He's different from us. He's not pioneering a route for us to follow. He is the demonstrated word of God about resurrection, but that's not the saying the same that that is going to happen to us. You can take it both ways, you see. And so Paul is saying this witness is confused and truth is truth. And what I want to establish to you is the truth of resurrection, not just the resurrection of Jesus, but our resurrection through that. This is where he's heading. OK, then verse next verse, verse 13, if there's no resurrection of the dead, as some of you are saying, then not even Christ has been raised. We have to be consistent. We have to follow through if this doesn't happen for, because Christ, Jesus Christ is fully human and he is dying as a human being and he is rising as a human being. I have to get into this. And if you don't believe in this concept, then you cannot follow through with this person and we cannot follow after him. Do you see, it's how you interpret and understand Jesus. If you see him as a man that's somehow filled with God, then you think in one way. If you think him as God masquerading as a man, you think of him in another way. It gets confusing, doesn't it? It's, and it's a paradox. Of course, it's a paradox. And of course, the paradox extends into, listen carefully, how you think of yourself, how I think of myself as a human being. Am I destined for the dust or am I designed for glory? What is the truth about humanity that Jesus, the anointed one, the Christ, is here to tell? Okay. If there's no resurrection of the dead, Christ has not been raised. And there are some immediate and profound consequences of that. And the third one, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. That word useless means 
it doesn't produce anything. It's like a, it's like a knife with no edge. It's useless. It looks like it should work, but it doesn't have an edge to it. It doesn't cut. It's useless. And your faith doesn't have an edge to it. It's useless. It doesn't produce anything. It doesn't cut through the difficulties of life. It doesn't see where things are going. It's useless. It's useless. If Christ has not been raised, our proclamation is useless. Our, our words, our preaching doesn't produce anything. It doesn't cut through. It doesn't reveal. It's useless. It's useless. It's non-productive. It's like a vaccine that doesn't work. And do you notice the way he brings two things together? Our proclamation about this, our preaching and our faith. Our preaching and your faith. But they run together because my preaching produces your faith. Your, your faith is in the word that I'm saying. Those two things run together. But if Christ is not risen, that is the nub of it. That's the heart. That's the foundation stone upon which everything else is built. If Christ is not risen, then this is just words. It doesn't achieve anything. And fourth, next verse, verse 15. If Christ has not been raised, then we are found to be false witnesses about God for we've testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. So I'm deceived and I've become deceptive. I'm just passing on useless stuff. It becomes a game. It's not only is my preaching useless, it's pointless. It's, it's, and, and it's deceptive. I am passing on not only useless information, but wrong information. I'm a liar. I'm a liar. It's because it all fits together, the, the preaching and the production of what's, what's preached. It's like when we say words, and our words have power, so long as they have integrity, so long as they are true, they have power. They have positive power when they're true. They have negative power when they're false. And we announce and proclaim. But if Christ is not risen, then that power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, is working in you. That's what Paul said, wasn't it? He said, but it's not, it's not there anymore. It doesn't work anymore. And I'm a liar. I'm a liar. And that's the consequence. Fifth, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you, you are still in your sins. Your faith is not producing anything. It, it is empty. It's, I think it's, that, I think it's the word sapros. It's futile. It's, it's, it's empty, but it's non, it doesn't reproduce. It doesn't grow. It doesn't have any sap in it, any life in it. And you, you're still in your sins. So notice that carefully, the resurrection is connected here with our salvation. If Christ is not risen, you're still in your sins. Salvation hasn't worked. And sixth, if Christ has not been raised, then those also who've fallen asleep in Christ are lost. So Paul's raising a very practical point here. Well, what about people who've died? If Christ is not risen, how do we pray and believe in hope for people who've died so well we, we can't we can't and there are consequences for those who've already died they're, they're lost they're lost and last verse 19 if only for this life we have hope in christ we are of all people most to be pitied and it's of course it's it's we're we're foolish we're saying something that's untrue we're saying something that doesn't produce anything we're just playing a game we're just announcing something that we don't believe in we are of all people most to be pitied now think about this verse very carefully 
because many people will go down this direction and say, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we're of all people most to be pitied. We are in a pitiable situation. And then comes verse 20. <laughs> are you glad to get to verse 20? Because then comes the complete turnaround. He says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Now, I realize I should shout that out. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And all of a sudden, with that sentence, all the negatives are flipped around and become positive. And this is the clarion call of Easter Day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And here it comes. Here it says Christ has indeed. In, that means in truth. And it also means in action. It's not just a concept, it's a practical reality. And the practical reality has those consequences, no longer negative, but positive. You have to take everyone and turn it a right the way around. First, our witness is not confused. It is clarified. It is clarified. And this is where we come together. And it doesn't matter what denomination you are. It doesn't matter what, what historical tradition you represent in terms of being a Christian. It doesn't matter what age or gender or ethnicity or anything or class. <laughs> we all come together on this one level playing field. I was reading somewhere that there are 40,000 separate denominations. I, I don't know. I've not counted. I know a few. And so they all, if it's Christian, this is what Christian means. It all comes together on this one level playing field of saying, in Christ, Christ has risen. He is Lord. Jesus is Lord. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And this is what the Lordship of Christ is. It is power over death. It is victory over sin. It is victory over the devil, over everything, over every negative spirit, everything that comes against it. Jesus is Lord. And Christ is risen. So our witness is not confused. Our witness is clarified. We have integrity on this one central issue. This is the nub. This is the foundation stone. So, well, we can argue about the other things later. <laughs> but this, this is a, what's that word? The Latin phrase sine qua non, without which nothing. This is our sine qua non without which not this is it this is the nub and every negative becomes a positive on this point christ is risen and so those who have died in christ are alive and our future is secure i don't need to worry whether they they're, they're lost or not they are in christ christ is risen their future is secure and my future is secure and my preaching is not deceitful. It is, it is, it has integrity. It has consistency because I'm speaking the truth. And I'm speaking the truth in the power of God, the gospel, the gospel of the resurrected Christ. Christ is risen and I'm not lying. I'm speaking, and there's a great strength in speaking the truth, isn't it? <laughs> I think it was Mark Twain. He says, I always speak the truth because my memory is so bad. <laughs> he said, I just need to be reduced to a few simple things. I just tell the truth, tell the truth. And this is the truth. And it's the truth that sets you free. And the truth is Christ is risen. It's not a deceit. It's a deliverance. And we are not to be pitied. We're all men, all people most to be envied. It's the opposite of pitied. We're envi enviable. My position is enviable. All this 
and heaven too. I am relaxed. <laughs> I am complete in Christ. Christ has died. Christ has risen. He is risen indeed, and I am in him. I'm in him. We're not to be pitied. We're to be envied. And our faith is not futile. Our faith is productive. It changes the way that you live. It, it challenges every compulsive behavior within you. It challenges every sin. It challenges the way that you consider your own past, the way that you think about your own future. There are two, two basic reasons led me to Christ. One was my guilt for the past. The other was my anxiety for the future. And here in the resurrection of Christ, there is a total solution for my past guilt and my future anxiety. I am set free in him. He has died for my sin and risen for my sanctification. Christ is risen indeed, and I am in Christ. And I am made into the, in him is righteousness, wisdom, sanctification. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. We're not to be pitied. We're to be envied. My faith is not futile. It is productive. And it's seed bearing, not just for me, but for those around me, those with, with whom I come into contact. It changes the soil of every life into which it's planted. This is a, a seed bearing idea, a concept, a truth that sets free. And listen to this. Oh, listen, listen. If Christ is risen, then I'm no longer in my sins. I'm no longer in my sins. I have been set free. It is finished. It is when Jesus said it is finished, he didn't mean I am done. He meant it is done. Well, what is done? The whole deal with sin and death is done. I am no longer in my sins. I am in Christ. There's only two places to be, in Adam or in Christ. That's the way Paul expresses the logic of the human condition. I am either in Adam or I'm in Christ. If Christ is risen, then I am no longer in my sins. Do you, get the, do you get the power of this? The moment, the astonishing moment of victory in this. We are not in our sins. We are not in our sins. Christ is risen. Let's pray. Father God, I just lift up this scripture to you and I declare the glad word of Easter that you are risen. You are risen indeed, Lord Jesus the Christ of God. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, reconciling me unto himself. And in you, my Lord, I am no longer in my sins. Fill our hearts with the victory of Easter and enable us to live lives of such celebration, such joy, that the world sees and wonders and comes to recognize. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.